Okay, so I'll give it a start. Right, I've pinned in. Oh, passcode. <laughs> 533756 with the passcode. Zoom ID 949. Well, only if you join the Zoom, you can see it, right? Yeah. But I don't know if someone maybe can share it on the platform. Okay. You're good? Okay, then. I'll kick it off with the automotive work group. First of all, let's take a short look on what we are aiming for. So we want to see and discuss the conditions, prerequisites, whatever is needed in the automotive sector to target use cases there. We want to derive requirements from the use case and what it means to the kernel, what it means to the development process of it. We know there is the ISO 26262, which put high demands on the safety in the car. And, yeah. and to start with, we are very open for any use case which could come up. And the first use case which we took was the dashboard. Why have we selected the dashboard? There are multiple reasons in there. One is that it comes with a good explainable system. So if we take the dashboard with warning signs, warning signs are the gear indication, warning signs are the check engine, oil pressure, whatever you can expect. And they need to be there displayed as safety information because if something is wrong with your car, you need to be informed. Another thing which is happening is that in the past, it were originally were light bulbs, then they turned into LEDs, and the LEDs are now going into the display, so you can see it's much more software-driven than in the past. So this gives you another reason to put it in, because the next thing is someone may want to start nice blending around it, wants to make it more pretty, wants to have some animated whatever things in there to have the telltale experience matching the whole car infrastructure. Another thing which is nice on this is that it's not only software driven these days, it's also that um, it has a good timing constraint. So if you imagine the use case, you're driving on the highway with a maximum speed, suddenly a light bulb goes on, so every, because everybody of you will just hit the emergency brake, check the manual and look what the light means, or maybe you just wait for some time to look for the next parking place, or even go home, because you think, well, my car will not die, it feels just driving normal, but I not, should know about it. So this gives you more relaxed timing constraint than hard real-time demands. The last benefit which we have in with this use case is that there is already a demo implementation of it available, which was created by the Automotive Grade Linux. They mentioned us as a partner project and typically also refer to us if it comes to the questions in their instrument cluster use case, working groups, and so on. The latest release, which AGL did, I guess, is called, oh, there was one last, Octopus, I guess. And we are still on Needlefish. The main reason why we are on Needlefish is that it's our demo is Qt based with the latest license changes of Qt. Uh, people moved on and say, well, it's not so commercially attractive for automotive anymore, for some members at least, and by this, the main track is now going to flutter as a new rendering framework, but the lower layers where we are looking in, into the kernel, into the graphics subsystem, it's basically independent from this upper layer. So, and what we did as extension with this Meta Eliza layer, which we put to the Yorkta tools, is that we add this little danger sign, which you can see there. Um, in real systems, you would not put this danger sign. So this danger sign is for you illustrating that we are in the system, that we hook on, do some modifications. And this illustrate this just, we detected a fault. This is danger. And then we would reboot, tr trigger a watchdog or whatever, and go into a safe state. All right. You will find a lot of these instructions in the Meta Eliza on the GitHub repo. So just go on github.com, Eliza Tech Meta Eliza. Uh, slides will be uploaded as mentioned. So for this, there's no need to click on it now. It provides a longer description on it, how to use it, and it gets combined with the workgroup automotive. Uh, we did this because we had people hopping on and off the discussion, the workgroups, and we discussed it 
again and again how things look like. And well, documentation is very important. It's not only important for safety, it's also important for open source in principle. And you want to make life easy for people to hook on. So we started with this description. Uh, we moved on a little bit on this. We figured out that, well, some people may use OpenSUSE Tumbleweed rather than many others using maybe uh, Fedora Linux or go also for Ubuntu. So by this, we saw there are differences. Next thing what we did was setting up a Docker container so that you have a Docker file. Then some people were, didn't want to run the Docker file to create the image. So we were providing the image and we were growing this step by step. And from time to time, there are always people who want to start from scratch again, so they just follow the instructions. Currently, we have a new joinee in the group who said, oh, yeah, I know there is this Docker file. I know everything is available. But I want to read the instructions again. And actually, I found already two broken links because Yocta Project just updated things. And that's where we want to have something continuously running so that things really work whenever you join in. And for this, we also set up a continuous integration. We did this together with the tools investigation and code improvement work group. Uh, we have a GitLab runner. You may wonder why source code is on GitHub while the CI runs in GitLab. It was a little better for the user handling and the forking of it. If you use the GitHub actions, you can fork repositories and you can, you need much more configuration and can have some pitfalls. If you don't do it right, people may have access to your servers and we have a server underneath, and this is better maintainable with GitLab. And here it's actually in this way that when someone joins the group and is listed in the GitLab, this person can actively uh, it just trigger a pull request in GitHub on a local branch, on a fork, refer this in the GitLab CI and do a run. So this could be if you want to save computation performance, if you don't have disk space or whatever. So these kind of things you can do with uh, the CI. It's not only building, it's also checking that the system boots, because if it would just build, you don't know if things work out of the box. Um, and when it's built, we also do a QAMO boot and share later on the rendered image so you can see that it really goes into rendering. It's not the one with the danger sign, which I took a screenshot from, but there's also the danger sign in there. However, what we figured out, it's not always the build which causes the issue. It could be just recently that the Cooksar CUNT stack, which we are using, had the client and server certificates expired. So 7th of April, we suddenly saw our CI failing. We're like, what has gone wrong? So we were looking all the sources. We couldn't find the sources, changes in there. We saw there was something on master, but the master was not changed by us, or we were not pulling it. And uh, well, you could argue if we would have put it directly to AGL, it may have been seen easier, but we're not yet there that we say we are as stable that we would like to provide our modifications to AGL. What we did instead also then for the analysis, we have an open QA setup running, hosted uh, by CodeThing on their servers. And what you can see with this orange line in there, you can basically move it from left to right. It's from GNOME testing and so on, where we do a QAMO emulation, reboot the system, and you can move the slider to see an expected and the real rendered output. So you do basically a initial run, you take, check the timings, and then you can just see that the danger is in there. And for the broken part, you could see that there was just the danger in the reference, but no longer in our rendering part. Right, and then next to it, you have the full information. You also get a video recording of the testing phase in the logs. You have the serial outputs. You could, we could see, okay, our signal source control app, which we have there as a mock. This was still operating. We could see uh, how at the boot go on, is there any version change, and so on. So this is from the testing part. And then further, we go for uh, the pipeline flow. So what we had in here is that we said, from a development perspective, um, we start with a meta Elizer. Within the meta Elizer, there are the BitBake recipes, the BitBake recipes can point to everything. You can even add also a component if you want to go there. And then this meta is taken from the Docker file. So it's referred in the Docker file. 
we generate the Docker image from it. And this generated Docker image, which would you download, so either you download your metalizer, you download a Docker file, which pulls the metalizer, or you download the pre-made Docker image. And we generate this on a regular base. So we do it more or less once a week that we build from scratch, and every night we just do a diff or using an as state build. And then also this Docker image is the base for the GitLab CI, which means the GitLab basically is acting like the user. So if you're using the system, also GitLab is using it. Whenever something would broke in the Docker image or in the Docker file or in Metalizer, the CI will show it. So there's really a dependency flow in there to the documentation around. And then later on, the GitLab, of course, builds the QAMO image, the QAMO image as built and downloadable for someone is there to then go into the open QA. So the open QA grabs it, does the testing. What is missing currently as a link back is that the open QA is not reporting back to the GitLab. So if the GitLab CI is running, it does not really do the check. It could say, well, our CI passes because from their, this perspective, the booting work, there is an image generated, you need to check manually, but we have this little intermediate step. And therefore, no. Another part is there that we also work on ASBOM generation. So we are just switching it on. We figured out that some function were not there, so we were giving it back to AGL, and then it was not an AGL topic, it was more the Yocto project topic, so uh, they discussed it there, and added some feature, did some backporting uh, for us because we're not on latest Yocto version. And so this is just getting enabled. Additionally, also we, as mentioned, we have the S state, so that we have cache binaries in there. If you would do a normal build, it takes you 100 gigabyte or something like this. This will not be there, All right? Here, yeah, so uh, as already mentioned partially, this gives you various starting points which are all interconnected. And for me personally, the most fancy one is that you can really just change two lines pointing to a new GitHub branch and uh, just let the whole flow go through, let the things compile, get the Q open QA run without even the need that you do things locally. And this is very helpful because when someone contributes a new feature in GitHub or a new bug fix, whatever gets in, we can just simply point to this PR, let the testing be done, and make a comment in the GitHub pull request that the checks worked out up to the test cases we are doing. And by this, nobody has to manually check it. It's basically two lines changes. We could most likely also automate some part there, but we haven't done this yet. Right. I guess I have one picture here, so let me just shortly sh see if I can start this. Uh, just so you just see it in operation. It was pretty fast, so I guess we still have the time for it. Try to run it from within the presentation, but it never works as you like to. So. Moving it to the right screen. And. Where is my pointer? So what you can basically see is uh, we open the terminal to start the QEMO image, so the instrument cluster is booting just normal. And then uh, you can see that we have the terminal window. So here we log in and start our signal source control app. <laughs> the signal source control app is a mock which has different options. So you can see you can interrupt the next message, you can uh, hook or blocks a system, and by this is for us a checking interface. This is just the visual part. There's just a command line interface, which is run in our testing. 
you would not need to do so, but the open QA test, for example, this does the check also via the control app. And the original pros is via name pipe, but it's hard to interact with it. So we just have a little bit of graphics command line interface for it. So if we run like this, now something was not rendered properly anymore. You see the danger sign propping up and the watchdog gets triggered and soon we should see that the things reboot. The rest of the system you could see was still operating, but uh, there was some corrupt messages. So we just start the system up. And similarly, I guess we do another run. And then there should be the danger sign detected So we do have one question in the chat. Oh, cool. Nice. Um, we had, well, we had two, and I just went and answered one of them, but OK. <laughs> um, cool. Then I'll just stop this one. So the um, what is QMU emulating for this example? Uh, would, what would the equivalent be on an automotive target? Yeah, let me close the window and go also. Yeah. Um, the QMO basically represents the standard AGL system. And we took this QMO because it's an easy access. It's not something which would go into the real system later on. So we basically uh, yeah, just need an easy starting point for people to do something. And this is a good question because if you would do the full analysis of your system, you will see most likely different slightly different interfaces because it's an x86 architecture rather than um, ARM architecture, which is heavily used in automotive. So we just, the this is a demo, this is a startup, this is looked for checking things, but it's not as good as you would go with the real hardware setup. And yeah, the equivalent automotive target on this would be you would take some hardware setup, um, we, we're looking with reference hardware from AGL. We have for the systems work group later on, I will talk about the Xilinx example from, uh, with the Xen, which we also now look into maybe the automotive work group. We were discussing also options like an orange pie, which gives you ARM hardware, but still, if you go to automotive and come up with the Raspberry Pi, an orange pie, rock pie, whatever you take, they just say, well, that's hobbyist hardware. If you suddenly pick up something like ST Micro, uh, NXP, Qualcomm, Samsung, Renaissance, if you take this kind of hardware, if it's more or less a similar thing, right, just with a not as good BSP support, maybe like the community hardware, suddenly it becomes attractive. And this is what we want to bring in there and also find a hardware later on, which is not only going for instrument cluster use case, but for telematics, ADAS, and so on. So this would be uh, the upcoming part. Right, the S-bomb was also the second question, where does the S-bomb come into play? Uh, so the S-bomb will be in the build phase, so we will, try, we will build the whole system. It grabs all the information which is in there for Yocto. We know that it will not be complete and 100% correct because it can just be as correct as the data which is provided. So uh, if there are any issues and in the certain component, if there is dual licensing, multiple licensing, this way not be perfect. And is, this is, uh, is the Docker image stage or before. Basically, it's not taking the Docker image as such, but it's going afterwards, it's going in the build. The Docker image is there to enable our build, to do the Yocto build, and the SPDX generation, ASPOM generation is in the Yocto build. If we talk about the systems work group later on, there we need to see how we combine this because we will most likely not only have the Yocto build, we also have the Bass West in there and the Xen build. We may go everything into Yocto, so we have just one build tool, but the multiple would also be there. And then it's inside the Docker, but not the SBOM for the Docker image. Container will be an interesting topic also on top later on. Good. Yeah, this is the main answer for the question. Let me get back to my slides. <coughs> Right, we already touched the STPA a little bit by Kate in the session before. Um, what I really like about this STPA thing is it's, I get asked, is it a replacement for something? Do I need to do the things? Uh, I make my way around with the answer and say, well, it's something which is aware, available. 
it's quite new and a lot of the other techniques are coming from the 70s and 80s and haven't evolved too much since then. And this gives you an additional view. And if we're talking about safety and it can add value to your safety analysis, why not using it? And here, as mentioned, this interaction with complex system really helps you to just understand. And we have pre-existing software, which is also not uh, typical in the automotive safety world. But here you can really look into a system, model the things you already know, and get this as a support. So for our example, we started with a fairly simple drawing with this telltale requester, can signal, and so on. We took it to a next level where more interactions were in there. Uh, I will not go through all these parts here. And just they, what we learned, for example, about this phase was there are examples of safe rendering engines. So there was some, uh, I guess, some cute uh, library which was aimed and got an ASIL, I guess even an ASIL D qualification. Uh, but it turned out, it, if I read it correctly, that it's mainly a tool qualification. And anyway, it's a good thing to sell and it will definitely improve the quality of the component because it's developed according to it. But Whatever goes in there in the forward pass basically need to be checked until the display and all the mechanisms which you're doing are pointless if you make to make sure that things are in there. So you cannot make everything safe in this forward part. You will always have a backward checking element in there which guarantees it could be in the display comparison. Go on. Oh, audience question. What you mentioned uh, things like ASIL and other things like that, and I was just concerned that the audience may not know what those things are. Ah, yeah. So um, the ASIL is the automotive safety integrity level, which ranging from QM, quality managed, up to uh, ASIL D. I guess I just lost the mic, could be. Okay, good. good. I don't hear myself anymore, so I was just, you, good, perfect. I couldn't hear myself anymore, so I was just confused. So. Um, the ASIL D would be really something for autonomous driving, very high level, more and more uh, methods, tools to be used, testing, NDAPs, and so on. While lower level ASIL A and B, you could find for lower level of safety, ADAS functionality, uh, braking, and so on. Actually, braking is a higher one. <laughs> braking is ASIL D. ASIL D. <laughs> this is one of the very crucial things, but our rendering of the telltales, for example, is just an ASIL B level. And um, you know, if you're coming from aerospace, it's basically just turn around there. I guess it's going with zero C, highest level, and then it goes up to five, where it's the lowest level. So here, higher letter means higher level of safety to be fulfilled. Right, yeah, and this is basically here the parse. So, and for our part, for this display rendering, you would do a check in the backward pass and need to make sure that whatever got rendered <coughs> is properly rendered. And here you would do the check. So whatever mechanisms you do in the forward pass is nice, but it's not the one which you need to do in the end because you need to make sure what there. So, and this caused a lot of discussion because we were saying, what do we do? What do we do properly for forward, backward? And this gives to the original first slide, basically, which Kate was showing understand your system sufficiently and do the measures where you need to. And you need to understand your Linux system that you put the mechanisms at the right places. And uh, the next picture which I want to show about this control structure is not following STPA. It's not an STPA diagram, but we see these three different regions of it. The one region, this yellow part, is basically the functioning part. It's the plain function which you do, which you would like to do as good as possible. And then you want to make sure that what you have done is running properly. This is the kind of orange, a little bit orange style color. Here you would do checks. You make sure that you have a monitoring and whatever gets rendered is really properly rendered. And the last part of it is this really dark orange one at the watchdog because this is a fundamental system part of our work. This challenge response watchdog is something which is very much known in automotive. It's also in other industries used. And basically, this watchdog makes sure it's clever enough checking elements in there. And for us, it means if we, we don't have real-time scheduling in the Linux kernel, so there could potentially be something in a very, very seldom case which caused something to stock, which caused a delayed execution. 
And here, this watchdog would send continuously messages, so it's outside of the Linux system. It's external watchdog for now with the watchdog module and does this check. And this is just the last safety case. And if you do a proper system design, this would never be triggered. So it's intended not to be used. It's just your final safety net that nobody will uh, die and we have a safe state. We have all this discussed. We started with a demo as I show how it all was set up. So this first QMO demo was done more than a year back, I guess almost two years back. And then we start all this discussion to write down demands, design, how does the system operate? And now we're at a state again where we need to map the model and the implementation. So we need to understand much more which subsystems are involved and then also involve the workload tracing, which will be the next session by Shua, and also uh, imp have an improved implementation. Why do we need to an improved implementation? So far, we have mocked certain things. So we are not doing full rendering check. We concentrated on the fundament of the watchdog, but not on the specific rendering mechanisms. And if we want to do a workload tracing, the workload should represent reality. And here we did from our analysis, from the discussion, we figured out, oh, we mocked up a little bit too much if we really want to understand the workloads. So what we see is we have now a CI we can easily modify. So whenever we improve this part step by step, whatever we do on this additions, we can check it properly. And we need to improve the information on how the components are involved. What does it mean for display checking? So that you really understand this is this component, this is safety monitor, this is the telltale checking, and so on. So we update this. We update the monitoring app as the next step. And this is the part needed to have the workload tracing. All right, a little further outlook on things we also want to do is to merge the automotive use case into the systems work group demo because currently we are a plain Linux system and whoever works with automotive will most likely ask where the autos are, where the autos, how do you handle these kind of things? Oh, I'm running in an SDV software defined vehicle environment. I want to use containers. I would like to have virtualization involved. And for this, we pick it up to see how does our analysis change when we involve this kind of system. We had the part about the QMO here comes a part that we were discussing currently, the exciting SU 102. This came from the uh, demo from Stefano, shown last year during Open Source Summit in North America. And we may then move forward maybe to the CREA system, which gives you also AI in there, AI vision parts, robotics, so for wider use cases and not limiting us to an instrument cluster. We still see a lot of room to trim down the kernel configuration, trim down the image size because it's based on a plain Yoktopoki. We may not need all the things. For example, could be we have thrown out the Wi-Fi driver because we believe that we don't need the Wi-Fi within the instrument cluster, at least not for the initial analysis. If someone comes up and finds a fancy feature with it, who knows? And what we also make as a hypothesis and assumption, we have workload tracing for medical and we hope to see similarities when we trace it to certain kernel parts, kernel subsystems, so that both things together will give us an idea which is really crucial, which is maybe more relevant to more use cases where we need to concentrate on first and get a high value for a lot of other industries. And yeah, we don't see it as a safety element out of contact, whatever we do, because we say, any safety element out of context always runs in an assumed context. So our assumed context is a telltale. If we would certify something, or not we, but a project would use it to certify based on this telltale use case, it doesn't mean that you can do an ADA system out of it. But maybe an ADA system will have similar demands to the kernel, similar check than there, maybe stronger real-time requirements, but this needs to be there. Because in the end, what it really burns down from this use case is checking a memory region against another memory region within a specified time. And this is maybe also something which goes to the medical devices where you need to make sure that whatever you set as glucose monitoring level goes forward in the proper things. Yeah, last part on this, if you see this drawing, I, I just took two examples. You could have park distance control, which you know from your ultrasonic beeping part if you go there, or you can even end up with certain camera use cases. And basically you see very similar things. The we have another sensor 
rather than maybe the engine sends a signal to say check engine, the beep sends the, the ultrasonic sensor sends a distance <coughs> rather than showing it on the screen so you have a speaker. And for camera, it would be more image data which need to be processed. And this gives you a scaling factor, it gives you a base. All will require a watchdog mechanism. And uh, yeah, so we hope that we can go further with more advanced use cases and also fulfill certain ADAS requirements. And by going with the hardware from currently a QA motor, it's something like the Xilinx part, or well, we we'll also basically look for something which gets a good community support, which gets a good BSP support, so it could be anything else as well, um, just which is available to others. We may have something which also goes into telematics, ADAS, and so on. All right. Do we have something more in the chat? Any questions from the audience? Yeah, there was a question. The last uh, is the S bomb intended as an input into the Docker image. But it could be. But it, yeah, it could be an input for the Docker image. Basically, we would most likely see it as an artifact and see the changes of the artifact which goes in. So there's not a direct demand for this, I, because. Yeah, the S bomb of the Docker image would be another question. It could be a double. Ask on them. There's one for the build system and the environment around it, how we build this thing, what is involved there. Our first ASBOM approach went more into uh, the ASBOM of the system in use. So there's the ASBOM of the device use, not the tools which have been used to generate the image, uh, which would anyway also need an ASBOM in the end <laughs> if it's all still based. And then you are with the ASBOM within the Docker, but it's two parts of it. <laughs> 